lifelong power. That is, that is the SEC and the Big Ten. And the power couple, I guess we could call it that, Yeah. they got together in Nashville this week. And for all of the talk about you know, college sports tomorrow, we went through their plan, what was it, last week or two weeks ago, uh, the group that's collectively together trying to come up with uh, a, a structure that will, will help push forward efforts to uh, oversee the future of college football. What are they calling it? The, the College Student Football League or whatever the they put CSFL? together? CSFL? Yes. Uh, Which it, I immediately think Canadian Football I League. Do too. When I hear the C in the CSFL. start of anything, the CFL. Uh, their transition plan. I mean, on paper, there are some aspects of it that I, I liked. But again, it's, you want to listen to those that are actually going to make things happen. And more or less, that's what we, we heard from Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti uh, at the meetings that took place with all the ADs in Nashville on Wednesday and Thursday. To me, what we saw in the presser whenever they spoke to the media, they are more or less telling everyone, if you didn't already know, we are Augusta National Golf Club, meaning we make the rules. You don't ask your way in. There's no amount of money that you can put forward and say, I'm going to join your exclusive club. Don't call us. We'll call you. That's more or less what Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti have, have said without saying it because they're not going to automatically jump in to the ocean that is private equity. Big 12 has to do it. Yeah. The ACC will too. But the Big 10, especially Petiti, was like, why would we ask for outside investment when we can restructure our overall plan play head-to-head -head more often, like we've seen recently, and do the exact same thing on our own and fund it ourselves. Meaning, we're the masters. We make the rules. And everyone else, you either follow or you're not in the club. Chad, I, I thought it was a, an alpha move. And if you weren't in that meeting, you're still following and they let everyone know. Well, until, you know, the Saudi Arabia and the private investment fund gets involved in college football and forces a merger, similar to what they did with Liv and PGA, uh, they have nothing that's going to spark them to try to come to the negotiating table with no. any conference that's not the Southeastern Conference or the Big Ten, because th that is the Super Conference. And I know Greg Sankey kind of didn't allude to it, sort of said it, like we, people talk about the Super Conference. We have this Super Conference between these two leagues and how lucrative both leagues have been and will continue to be. So why change anything dramatically or let anyone else have a piece of that pie yeah. if you're the Big Ten in the SEC? And Hutton, I think that's the big dilemma moving forward. It's been the dilemma for a while now. Like, we love college football because on a given Saturday, we can turn on our television or our streaming device and we can flip back and forth between games all over this country in different leagues that have different vibes, different feelings to it, and really get a sense of everything going on. That doesn't happen, you know, if you just have 35 teams playing. It's the NFL. The NFL doesn't have as many games. Yes, the quality is tremendous, but there's not as many games to worry about. So, I mean, we all know the SEC and the Big Ten lead the way, but if you want to do what's best for the whole of college football, you do need to have some consideration at some point for every other league. But right now, if you're asking the Big Ten and the SEC, their responsibility is not to the Big 12 no. or whatever the Pac-6 is going to be or whatever the ACC is right now. Their responsibility is to their stakeholders, their universities, their members, right, and their television partners. That's it. So why would you change any of that if you're the Big Ten or the SEC? And I think that's, what's, that's what Petiti and Sankey are telling everyone. Yeah, they're, and they're, they're also saying, hey, uh, our, our television partners want – to have the amount of teams that we have right now, right? That's yeah. how I take it. They're not saying we're going to, you know, name a number and split off and have, you know, the, the aspect of the, the non-Power 5 can work their way in. Not going to be that way, at least not now, unless they're just blowing smoke to appease the networks that they just got into a long-term contract with, where the $100 million deals are about to come in. Yeah, and I think that the next group that could really force some change and all that would be ESPN, Disney. You know, if one of the networks and the, the biggest one came in and said, 
we need something that includes all these other leagues and you need to be willing like they to play the ball with them, then, then you might see some change there. But, I mean, call it whatever you want, the CSFL – yeah. Uh, the whatever you want to put on top of that name of whatever this is, it's still going to be the SEC and the Big Ten leading the way. Yeah, and it, again, I, I would say it, when you see a headline of any proposal and it doesn't include Sankey or Petiti behind it, it's 99% a pipe dream. Yeah. That's it. And especially if you're looking for media coverage in order to push your agenda, which is what which, this group did. It's also why I thought it was odd. Danny White, Tennessee's athletic director right here in Knoxville, He's a part of that, whatever that alliance coalition is yeah. about this proposal. And there were a few other ADs or school presidents on that list. I just found it interesting. I'm not saying it's a bad move, good move, indifferent, whatever. But the fact that Danny White, who's commissioner, is arguably the most powerful man in college sports, would put his name on this, I, that's something, well, right? And you had the president from West Virginia. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, it, E. Gordon Gee. Again, uh, all the conferences were represented. Yeah. And uh, primarily, it's from those that are not represented by the SEC or the Big Ten. Right. Chad, uh, we mentioned college football playoff. There are impactful college football playoff games coming up both tonight and tomorrow across the board. Early, midday, evening, late night. Chad's got his list ready. He prepared it on the way to Knoxville today. It's deep. It's extensive. It's time for Chad Withrow's Top 10 Gage of the College Football Weekend. Need more reasons to watch college football? It's time to bang some hats. Here's Chad Withrow's I'd much like one of the characters in Top Gun, one of my weekend. favorite movies. This list is long and distinguished, right? That's, it is. That's what it is. That's what we're talking about when we get to our Top 10 College Football Games of the Week. Hutton, we thought it was going to be a light week a week ago. But what happened? Chaos ensued. All Down goes vocals. Alabama to Vanderbilt. Down goes Tennessee to Arkansas. Five of the top 11 teams in America went down last week. This week on paper looks terrific. Yes, Games it does. aren't played on paper, though. They're played on grass. And in lesser instances, they're played on some artificial surface that I hate. But I, football should be played on grass. That's what I'm trying to say right here. It'll be played on grass tomorrow in Neyland Stadium. Thank God for that. Ten games that I'm looking at this week. One of them uh, will be at Neyland Stadium. We'll get to that momentarily. Hutton game number ten. Let's go to the SEC, one of those power conferences we were just discussing. What is Vanderbilt's encore? What is Diego Pavia's encore? Diego Pavia went from talking about God speaking to him to go to Vanderbilt to saying Vanderbilt effing turnt in a matter of seconds in a postgame <laughs> interview. This guy is a deity of college football. Will he play like that in Lexington, Kentucky? That's a big question. Vandy at Kentucky. Kentucky, a 15-point favorite in this one, which really surprises me. 745 Eastern on SEC Network. Vanderbilt, here's the problem with the doors. They are 112th nationally in third down defense. Kentucky, we know how they play. They want to play great defense. Their offense is not explosive. They want to grind you down the way they did Ole Miss. They want long drives. Can they do that against this Vanderbilt defense that has not been very good with third down defense so far this year, Hutt? Chad, I always question Vanderbilt, but it's always as a team that I expect that will not live up to the moment. More on this coming up in wrong team favor. Yes, yes. We'll save that for you, certainly, for later. Game number nine, Arizona at number 14 at BYU. The Cougs, a big favorite in this one. 4 p.m. on Fox, BYU, an unexpected, undefeated team so far this season. Um, star on defense for Arizona. Traden Dukes tore his ACL in their last game. A player to watch for BYU, Jake Retzlaff. 1,200 yards passing on the year. He's also the Cougs' leading rusher. Hutton, BYU is a team we haven't spent a lot of time discussing. They came into the season, picked either last or second to last it's, in the Big 12. Awesome. And here they are undefeated, and they don't look like a pretender. They don't have a very low ceiling, uh, a low floor. It, 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 you look at what they're doing, uh, it's not boom or bust. Arizona is. They either play great or they disappoint. So if, if Arizona shows up, they can pull the upset here. BYU's on alert, though, because we've seen the unbeatens go down recently over the last two weeks. Arizona beats Utah, and then the next week yeah. turns around and loses to Lose. Texas Tech. Yeah. You're right. That's kind of been the tale of their they season so far. They lost to K-State. 
big win followed by yep. sometimes Oops, yeah. unexpected it, loss. It, it is uh, win big or look awful. Yep, and that, that can be said for a lot of teams. Uh, game number That's eight, fair. a team that has yet to lose this season. The Iowa State Cyclones, yes. The Iowa State Cyclones, 11th in the country, undefeated. The problem for Iowa State is their one notable win was a last-second field goal against Iowa. They haven't really played anyone yet. They're going to play someone on Saturday at West Virginia. This game at 8 p.m. on Fox Morgantown, a difficult place to play. West Virginia 2-0 in the Big 12. Iowa State 5-0 on the season. But a big issue for the Mountaineers, Garrett Green, their star quarterback, what's the status on his shoulder, which has been an issue? Is he going to be able to go? Iowa State, Hutton, you've got to beat them. They're not going to beat themselves. Fewest turnovers in college football in FBS. Second fewest penalties wow. in college football. Matt Campbell's teams, they are going to make you beat them. That is how you win on the road. The road has not been kind to ranked teams this season. This is how they go and win on the road in Morgantown. Game number seven. A lot of Big 12 action. formula, yes. A lot of Big 12 action. We I like so it so far. Big 10 and SEC hut, but Big 12, they're having a moment right now, especially in this week. Game number seven, Kansas State 18th ranked Wildcats. Three and a half points, slight favorite on the road at Colorado, 10-15 Eastern on ESPN. These are two former Big 12 rivals going head to head now. A uh, first trip to Boulder since 2010. So Colorado coming from the Pac-12 to the Big 12. They're now reunited in this conference. Both teams coming off a of bye. It's really a tale of two different styles. Kansas State, they're going to run it. Avery Johnson at quarterback. DJ Giddens at running back. Colorado, what are they going to do? They're going to chuck the ball all over the yard. Shador Sanders, Travis Hunter, a great group of wide receivers for the Buffaloes. Hutton, I'm excited about this game. And here it is, Coach Prime. We're midway through the season. He's only got one loss. I know, And man. we were coming into the year saying, if he could get this team to a bowl game, he may be bolting for a bigger job. That's looking like it's going to happen now. Oh, man. So Kansas State, they traveled and went on the road. And they lost. They lost to BYU three weeks ago, 38 to nine. The road, not kind. It, neither is the secondary. Colorado, this, this is a live dog right here. I considered, I considered the Buffaloes for wrong team but, favorite. But you, we can't spoil it, but you, we'll I find out. We'll find someone out wrong else team favorite, if he took it or not. I, I do I, like Colorado at home. I'm guessing that you did not, yes. Game number six, more Big 12 action. Number 16, Utah. A four and a half point road favorite at Arizona State. The Sun Devils playing at home 10.30 Eastern time tonight on ESPN. Defense is key for Utah. They just lost 23 to 10 to Arizona, but that's how they're gonna play. Arizona State has a big bruising back by the name of Cameron Scadaboo, which is a terrific say that name. Again? Cameron Scadab excuse me, Scadabo. I wanna say Scadaboo. Oh. It rolls off the tongue easier. Scadabo equally is awesome. Cameron Scadabo. 378 yards to the ground, three touchdowns so far this year. That's over the last two games. Uh, Hutton, I'm excited about this one. Friday night action, Arizona State undefeated at home so far this season. And, and you mentioned defense for Utah. This would be the best defense that that we've seen Utah face as well. Is it Cam Rising? Cam Rising for is. For sure. He's, uh, I, I, I have not seen the latest time. report. Yeah. It, another questionable week. I mean, is it Isaac? Will, if it's Isaac Wilson, this is another upset alert. For, for me, because Arizona State, again, uh, defensively, they can get it done against the offensive uh, firepower like they're of with Isaac Wilson. If Cam Rising plays, I'm taking the Utes. Uh, I, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun to watch tonight. Late night game tonight on a Friday, uh, either way. Game number five, we're here. We're in Knoxville. We know how important this game is to Tennessee fans. How important is this game to Billy Napier? Well, he may get fired on Sunday if he gets his ass kicked in this game at Neyland Stadium on Saturday night. This crowd will be alive Amped. for this game. Do not let one loss to Arkansas fool you. This town is alive. It's ready to go. That crowd's going to be ready. It's Checker Neyland night at Neyland Stadium. Tennessee, a 15-and-a-half-point favorite. They only dropped to number eight nationally, still in the top ten, still very much alive in the thick of it for a college football playoff berth. Florida coming in, playing better. They look competent now. A win over Mississippi State, big on the road, a win at home over UCF. We know Mississippi State's bad. Remains to be seen how good uh, UCF is. Hasn't been good so far this season. 
for Tennessee, Florida's 17 and two against the Vols, but they've lost 10 of 11 against top 25 teams. So something's got to give in this game. Vols defense is elite, we know that, but they became more of a bend but don't break squad against Arkansas. Gave up a ton of yards, and keep in mind, they gave up only 19 points, and seven of them were on purpose at the end of the game where they let Arkansas walk in. They may have held them to another field goal the way they had through most of the game. 19 points is not going to cover it, uh, cover it though. Tennessee's offense has got to be better. Hutton, Tennessee's defense leading the nation in third down efficiency and third down stops. Opponents only converting 21% of the time. So it shows you the respect that Vegas has for Tennessee. You mentioned Florida's playing better. They own the history of this. Yeah. And it's still as steep of a climb against the spread as, as you'll see in this matchup between Florida and, and Tennessee. That, I, I trust Tennessee more than I do Alabama this weekend to respond off of a loss. Yeah, it's all about how much do you believe in inherent um, mental problems when it comes to an opponent? Because Josh Heifel's Tennessee teams are different. Yes. You know, they did beat them here in Knoxville two years ago, and Florida played great in that game, and Tennessee still found a way to win. But this is a series that has a way of Tennessee plays it's, down, Florida plays up. It's going to be a crazy game. And it leads to some wild outcomes. So we'll be here for it. We'll see what happens. Game number four, number four, Penn State, a four-point favorite at USC, 3.30 Eastern time on CBS. USC has scored at least 20 points in 27 straight games. That's before wow. they ran into that juggernaut, Minnesota, and they held them to 17 points in a 24-17 loss last week. For Penn State, they're the only FBS team hunting to start 5-0 and in each of the last four seasons. Wow. This is a game that the loser of it, there's going to be a lot of angst around that head coach. Even though it could be Penn State's first loss of the year, and it could be Lincoln Riley's third, yes. there's going to be a lot of chatter about those head coaches. SC has eight turnovers in the last three games, and they can't pass protect. To me, this is one of the games on the road that Penn State goes and wins. But again, like you said, the pressure is on Penn State to go and win because USC has shown when they travel, they lose. When they host games, we'll see. We'll see if the road team travels and loses against the Trojans. I, I'm not betting against Penn State yet. Not yet. If Penn State's win at West Virginia was a really good one. Other than that, it's been a lot of blah throughout yeah. the season. I Huge don't believe in either team. on the road at USC. I, I'm with you but a huge test for Penn State on the road at USC. Game number three, Red River shootout. Red River rivalry, whatever you want to call it. Shootout. It's a hell of a football game every single year when these two teams get together. And the unexpected tends to happen between Texas and Oklahoma. The Longhorns, a 14 and a half point favorite, 330 on ABC. Texas, they enter the game as number one. They entered this game, Hutton, against Oklahoma as number one for the first time since 1984. Quinn Ewers. How healthy is he? What's he going to look like in this game? Oklahoma is 122nd nationally in total offense. That's no bueno. But Michael Hawkins, he's gotten them going a little bit. He must run. He's an effective runner. Must run for Oklahoma to have a chance in this game. Regardless, though, Hutton, always exciting when these two get together. This is going to be a, a great matchup. I would take the points. Keep this in mind, though. Hawkins is the first true freshman to start in this rivalry matchup for Oklahoma in the history of Texas and Oklahoma. That's crazy to me. True freshman starter. He could be a legend at the end of this day and if he, he's he able to spring the He trained with stuff. Kyler Murray's father 38 miles away from where they'll kick off the game. Amazing. Game number two. We ready to get back into the SEC? Yes. Number nine, Ole Miss, a three and a half point favorite at LSU, number 13 in the country, 730 on ABC. So for Ole Miss, this is big. They've already lost to Kentucky at home. They've got Oklahoma and Georgia visiting them later this month. Last year's game between these two, 1,343 combined yards between these two in a shootout win for Ole Miss in Oxford. Garrett Nussmeyer has really continued on with the standard of LSU and Brian Kelly quarterbacks, yeah. leading the SEC with 15 passing touchdowns so far. Brian Kelly Hutton, a lot of talk about him, the job he's done. The dude is 12-0 and at night at LSU at home so far. And he is 16-1 and at home. So what he's done is win games in Baton Rouge. Will he get it done in this one? 
and pot, and maybe sort of send Ole Miss spiraling out of the college football playoff talk. The numbers favor Ole Miss, Chad, but wins don't favor Lane Kiffin in this situation. However, LSU is averaging, they're allowing over seven yards per pass against power four opponents. That sets up perfectly for the Rebels to go on the road and win, despite the environment. This is a troll game for Kiffin in my mind. I, I see something post-game from him. I, I totally agree. By the way, is there any surprise who the game number one is no. this week? Um, sorry, SEC fans. This one's going to the Big Ten this week. Number two, Ohio State, a three-point favorite at number three, Oregon. The Ducks usually play very well at home. This is Ohio State's first trip to Eugene in 60 years. Last meeting between these two teams, Kayvon Thibodeau had a big game for oh, Oregon. Yeah. Oregon went to Ohio State in week two and shocked the Buckeyes 35 to 28. And that was a game where I think they were 14 point favorites and Oregon won outright in that game. Dylan Gabriel has got to be better. He's done yes. three interceptions in two Big Ten games so far. Ohio State, Hutton, plus 39.2 points per game. That's their margin of victory. Best in college football. And all the talk about the 17-year-old at Alabama. Let's talk a little bit more about Jeremiah Smith, freshman for Ohio State. 23 receptions so far this season for the Buckeyes. Another great He's one. terrific also. Yeah, another great one. It's the first time since 2014 that we have a matchup of two versus three where the road team is favored. Last time it happened in 2014 was Ole Miss and Auburn. It's been a bit. Um, I realize why the Buckeyes are favored. They can go in and play great defense, and they can run the football. That's how you beat Oregon. But yeah. Oregon still hasn't had their breakout game. Well done. That is our top ten games. Of the I week, think it's uh, I think it's tremendous.